So thanks for that introduction. I totally don't remember that happening at all. Um, but it is probably a good sign for any of you students out there. You should cold call and cold email people. Um, my inbox has gotten out of control. So at this point, I say if you cold email me, give it a couple days and then do it again and keep that cycle up until I eventually get beaten down and respond to you. Um, because I do want to respond to these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, inbox problem. Um, for those of you who are interested in my rantings about the beautiful weather in California or politics, Jillian R. Hayes is your Twitter handle. If you are interested in learning more about autism technology more broadly, Autism Tech is your handle um, for me from a Twitter standpoint. Um, I apologize. I normally try to post accessible versions of my slides, and I just completely forgot. Um, that's sabbatical brain for you. So if anyone needs uh, um, accessible versions of the slides, please don't be shy um, in emailing me, and I will be happy to get those to you. And I believe they're recording uh, the talk as well, so I can also get those to whoever's recording if that's helpful. Okay, so here's my career in a slide. Um, as Michael said, my background's in computer science. I started out at Vanderbilt um, in Nashville, Tennessee, but otherwise uh, similar to Stanford in a lot of ways. Uh, proper computer scientist. I actually thought I wanted to do theory. I had a double major in math, and I loved doing proofs. Um, but I wasn't quite ready for grad school. So I went first to Deloitte and then to Avanade, where I discovered the people actually interact with your computing systems. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so I went back to grad school at Georgia Tech, where I started out doing lightweight note taking, um, and then quickly discovered that some of the most interesting sort of issues with note taking actually involved uh, chronic conditions. And in particular, I started doing work in autism. Um, my advisor, uh, Gregory Abowd, who many of you have probably either met or read, uh, has two kids with autism. So that's what got me interested in that space. Um, and I've continued that work now for, for quite some time. Um, after I got my proper faculty job at Irvine, I decided I needed to go back and refresh my skills a little bit. This is a common thread in my career of going back and forth, academia, industry, uh, back and forth. So I went and worked at an agency, RoundArch, which is now RoundArch Isobar, for a little while. Um, so if any of you are thinking about agency life or consulting life, I'm happy to talk to you uh, later this afternoon about what that's like. And then I've been at Irvine for 10 years. Um, and as Michael said, I'm on sabbatical at the moment. Can't you tell? I'm absolutely terrible at sabbatical. Um, I continue to spend way too much time on campus and other things. But the two primary things that I'm working on while I'm on sabbatical are these two startup companies. So a company called Avie that focuses on uh, private aviation and a company called AssurePoint, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit more today, which is focused on insurance. Um, and that will all become more clear Soon enough, I promise. OK, so personalization. Most of the time, when we think about personalization, this is the kind of stuff we're thinking about. We're thinking about how we each have our identity deeply enriched and enmapped in our Starbucks cups or your Pete's cup or whatever your preference might be. Um, increasingly, manufacturing has become so cheap that we're having all of these sort of personalized gifts. Um, this is. This kind of thing is what gets sent to the family back east every December um, in my household, and it's probably a similar kind of experience for many of you. We have things like Netflix, of course, that you're, you all are very familiar with. At last count, Netflix had around 100,000 genres listed in their database, which is about as micro as I think you can get when you think about the kind of personalized selection processes we might be doing with our movies. Um, but basically, what I want to say is that personalization, it's no longer about customizing our preferences and shouldn't be. Um, you know, it's not even just about learning what content we might want to consume or really micro segmenting that in the way that Facebook and Twitter and Netflix and these other kinds of companies do. But in fact, we now are in a place where a combination of sort of new kinds of platforms and interaction models and algorithms and tons and tons and tons of data means that we don't have to have all these customization engineers. Netflix has a few hundred of them. Um, we're, not, we're moving towards a world in which we're not going to have those kinds of folks anymore. The algorithms are going to do this. This is the thing that's terrifying people, right? So this is sort of your last picture here is personalization getting out of control, uh, I'm sure. 
No, actually, if any of you are undergrads, you're probably not watching the news at all because you are living in a bubble. Um, but for those of you who are not undergrads, you're probably very aware of the fight over things like fake news. Gartner just predicted that within the next three years, we're going to consume more fake news than authentic news. Um, and I think that's actually probably um, a longer time frame than it's going to take, right? So this is the sort of downside of all of this push towards personalized content. If we feed everyone what they want all the time, there can be challenges. But it's a nice Friday afternoon. It's, the sun is coming out. We're not going to talk about that stuff. We're not going to talk about the dark world of algorithms. Instead, what I want to talk to you about is the new platforms for true personalization. So I think most of the world has unfortunately not necessarily thought about large groups of people. So um, as Michael said, I think a lot about underrepresented or vulnerable populations. This started out in my work with autism, and you're still going to hear about uh, people with autism today, other kinds of accessibility, chronic health concerns, and other people who are left out of the economic market, out of design decisions, and so on. So beyond just these sort of AI and algorithmic possibilities, we live in this world in which our perceptual reality can and does change. And if you're a person whose perceptual reality looks a little bit different than someone who's typically developing, if you have a chronic condition, if you have uh, a disability, if you have a neuro neurodevelopmental difference, um, then this creates a whole bunch of opportunities where we can shape reality to be something that is the most comfortable, that is the most effective for you. Um, as I said, there's also other ways in which we're shaping reality that we're not going to talk about today. Um, so uh, this is an image I took from Deloitte and modified a bit. But this gives you some idea of at least what the industry is thinking about in terms of new platforms for personalization. So we do, we look at things like chatbots on the one end that are moving away from sort of the point, click, and type, but we're still using sort of our traditional smartphone or, or uh, computer-based interfaces. I just saw, um, as I was flying up this morning, I got prompted with a news story about the Wobot, which um, I just like to say because it's cute. Um, <laughs> but you know, these kinds of chatbot interfaces to perform all kinds of things. And the Wobot, for those of you who don't know it, is a, a piece of work from a psych professor here at Stanford focused on cognitive behavioral therapy through chatbots. Um, and these are kind of the new kinds of platforms that I think are really interesting, you can have a therapist who's truly customized to your needs um, through these kinds of things. Things like touch and swipe and talk and so on and gestures that a lot of uh, the PhD students that I've talked with today are working on. Well, um, a lot of futurists are sort of looking at this. They put forth a really compelling vision for this spectrum. But I will point out that most of these futurists think that most of our users look like that guy. Um, <laughs> And so, yes, they all look like Michael. Um, and so what I try to do is sort of problematize that and unpack it. I want to support Michael. I do. I like him quite a bit. But I also want to support a lot of other people who are not necessarily represented in what we're thinking about here. Um, and so we can do that now in really interesting and exciting ways because we have 3D printing, because we have augmented reality and virtual reality and these other things. So with, I want you to bear that in mind is that what I try to do is play with these new platforms to think about how they can support people who've traditionally not been well supported by technology and think about that in a different way. So we'll start with 3D printing. This guy's super excited about 3D printing. Um, his name is RC Life On, and he loves 3D printers. Um, he does reviews of them on YouTube. So if you're ever in the market for a 3D printer, you can check him out. He get, he's, uh, he's kind of entertaining. Um, but you know, we have this question about like, why is he so excited? What is so exciting about 3D printing? Well, you can do stuff like this. Um, this is a, a bobblehead of me um, that my advisor, Gregory About, here made. Jen Mankoff is the other person in this picture who's also holding a bobblehead of her. Her bobblehead is sitting in a yoga pose knitting. Mine is baking a cake. Um, because you can make personalized gifts. And that's pretty cool. But God help us if this is all we're doing with 3D printers, right? Um, let's hope that this is not the end all be all of personalization. So at the other end of personalization is thinking about truly making custom platforms for people who don't have the same kind of access and opportunities 
that many of the people in this room do. So just some stats for you on blindness in the US. Um, almost four million people have a serious visual disability, so that usually means they're legally blind. Uh, they maybe have some sight, but have a very serious disability, and that's between the ages of 18 and 64. The reason we look at these numbers is they're economic indicators. So um, this is typically what's considered working age. Also, beyond 64, nearly everyone starts to have some kind of visual disability at some point anyway. We're all going to have a visual disability, by the way. Um, just give it time. You will get there. Um, less than half of this group is employed. If you're blind, the likelihood is cognitively, otherwise physically, everything else, you are exactly the same as a sort of typically developing neurotypical person. But yet, less than half of this group is employed. Why is that? Well, a lot of it, we believe, is because we don't have access to computational systems in the same way for people who are blind as for people who have sight. And it's deeply inefficient to use your trip, typical sort of office-related products and other kinds of things that you would use in a workplace if you're blind. It just takes a really long time. Eventually, we start to have problems there. At the same time, the younger ages are not reading Braille anymore. So this is the way we used to sort of get around it. When you had paper-based reports and so on, everyone just learned to read Braille. Almost no one reads Braille anymore. This is largely because of the uh, advent of screen readers and other kinds of audio-based technology. So all of the ways that you could sort of be as efficient are disappearing. Um, and so what you do see occasionally, you see very expensive Braille displays. So this is um, the equivalent of a computational display, but uh, with Braille, you swipe your finger across it. They're outrageously expensive. They're hard to learn. They're hard to come by. They break a lot. Um, auditory screen readers and so on, and magnification. So if you have any sight at all, what you'll typically see is people magnifying their screens intensely. That's more efficient than a screen reader, but it's still pretty inefficient if you think about the way that we interact with, with most GUIs. And for those of you who haven't seen a screen reader before, I will hopefully play one for you. Play. Or not. Oh, there we go. Link search, link images, mail, link drive, link calendar, link sites, link groups, account options, heading level two. Mark Baldwin mail by Google. Folders, heading this level is my two. Student Mark's inbox spam 26, email, so. link alt plus. Mark Baldwin mail inbox. Link search, link images, mail. Table with 36 rows and four columns. Row one, column one, checkbox not checked. Out of checkbox, column two. I. Column three, link, link February 20th. Column four, February. Row two, column one, column two, UAW. Column so you three, get the link, idea. February, link it's executive. Horrible. Um, and that was Mark using it, and he's a pretty adept screen reader user, and he was clicking through sometimes before the thing actually was finished reading it. The problems you have with screen readers are you have lexical and semantic information thrown together um, all into this auditory channel, and the auditory channel is ephemeral, and it's linear. And this is just a really hard way to process a lot of information. So what you see is people backing up, re-listening to the same thing over and over again, sometimes skipping things because they're trying to go quickly and so on. So what we've been working on uh, is pulling the semantic information out of the auditory and putting it into the tangible. So what we talk about is reappropriating the physical metaphors. You have this metaphor of a desktop. You have metaphors of file folders and other kinds of things that were originally physical interactions that you had in the office place. And we moved those into a virtual model. And that basically made it really hard for anyone who's not using visual uh, interaction. And so we want to pull those back out into the physical world. So the two systems that you see here, and this is one of uh, a participant in a study that we did doing some online shopping. And what's going on here is on the one hand, there's a uh, scroll bar. That's what's on the left side there that bumps when you hit links um, and has varying sort of um, resistance. So it feels uh, like a bigger or smaller document depending on how big the web page is and so on. And then what's on the right hand side is a context switcher. So you grab these little die and they have braille characters uh, printed on the top and you know, okay, this die is associated with Amazon and this one's associated with eBay and this one's associated with another shopping site so I can switch between the sites and so on. Um, 
And this is just uh, showing us what the screen reader output was going on on the other side. You can't get rid of the auditory channel altogether with Tangible. We're still gonna have to get the sort of text or lexical data out of the um, auditory, but this allows you to be a little bit more efficient with things. Um, and what we saw was that, especially with novices who weren't super adept with all the keyboard shortcuts and other things that you might see with screen readers, you see substantial improvement very quickly. So you can sort of walk up and use this kind of system in a way that screen readers take years of uh, practice and learning to get adept with them. So that's the tangible desktop. We've been moving forward from this a little bit um, and I'll show you kind of what this translation looks like. So we've got sort of the abstract representation of the computational interface on the left there and what you would see with a traditional screen reader is it would read out, as you just heard, heading level one, introduction, link, more information, and so on. What we do instead is provide a little day tent so it basically feels like you're running your finger across a ridge that tells you that it's a header. It tells you introduction and then it reads introduction and a little uh, vibration that tells you you've hit a link and that gives you more information. So you get a sense of kind of how that works. And here's uh, the results I was mentioning. So 39% improvement for the novice users, improvements for every participant. We did this with sighted users as well. I'm just showing you the blind ones here. Sighted users also improved, but I just don't care about them as much as the blind users. Um, and it's not surprising that sighted users would not know how to use a screen reader. Um, what's interesting about the blind users, of course, is they all were uh, working with their system versus ours. So we didn't have a controlled screen reader. This is their screen reader and their magnification setup and everything that they traditionally used on their own personal computers. So actually, their walk up and use of our system was better than what they were doing um, with their systems that they were using. But they'd all only been screen readers for about six months to a year. So they were part of a training program learning screen reader use. Would you attribute to the decoupling of semantic and like textual information, and how much would you attribute to essentially the ability to get a better focus plus context view? Um, I think both are true. What we see in the field work, so what we did before we did this is um, about a year of field work with the same group, and what we saw is they get lost in the audio a lot. Um, so that's where the decoupling helps because it's just less stuff. Um, so they're not hearing as much audio. Um, and then they don't know what the computer's done. Um, so you see a lot of where people get lost, and we actually didn't address this in this system, but in the next one we're working on it. Um, but you get, you get sort of the computer has done something to be smart to help you, and you've lost that because you can't see it. Um, so autocomplete is a really good example of this. It doesn't, the screener doesn't read it out. Um, so you wind up typing the same word like six times because you, you start typing it and it's auto-completing it and doing a bunch of other things that um, are just broken in the way that we deal with, with, with websites for, um, for people with visual disabilities. But I also think the focus plus context thing is huge and I'm super glad that you asked because it's a really good segue into the next thing. Um, so. We, you know, we sort of, after we had this early success, we stepped back, we started working with our partners um, at this employment agency for people with visual disabilities and said, well, what's this bigger problem? And some of it is this focus plus context kind of issue. Uh, so let's just say I decided to, I'm working on a paper and I've put it away and I come back to it the next day and I want to pull it up. So I have this overall activity that I want to do and uh, think about this as writing a paper. Well, it turns out that writing a paper actually has all of this other stuff involved with it, right? So it has the word processor that I'm actually writing the paper on. We do pretty well with word processors actually for visually impaired users. But I also need to look at the literature and maybe I have multiple papers open plus um, you know, Mendeley or whatever I'm using to manage my citations. I want to message with my co-authors. I've got a Slack channel open or whatever the case may be, and I'm trying to chat with people about this paper and so on. So there's a whole bunch of other parts that are inside this activity. And for sighted users, we have lots of ways of dealing with this. One is our monitors are quite big now. We tile things out. We might even move things into a virtual desktop that we're flipping between really quickly, and we're pretty facile with that. But for a non-sighted user, this takes a really long time to actually just sort of pull the context back up, figure out where you were, what was going on, and deal with, dealing with it. And so we turned to activity theory 
to, as a way of thinking about this. So if some of you may have seen activity-based computing, but this idea that we need to actually organize things and think about things as a human activity as opposed to a set of applications that we might be using, um, which is a lot of overhead for a sighted user because we can just so quickly pull the stuff back in. But for someone who doesn't have, cannot be as facile with things, thinking in an activity and saying, I want to restart that activity that I was working on, remember everything about it, actually becomes really important. Um, so what we think about here is organization by activity. So we've been developing activity tokens. What are, way, what are tangible ways for people to associate? I was working on a paper. I was working on a job application. I was doing whatever with a particular token, something physical that I can grab and say, OK, I'm working on that activity now. Activity context, so being able to pick up exactly where you left off so you don't have to have your screen reader read your entire paper to you until you get to the point where you want to be. Um, and a lot of websites and even um, you know office products now are getting to where you, you pull it up and it says, hey, welcome back. Do you want to start on slide 27 where you last were? That works, again, pretty well for sighted users. That's not an interaction that works well yet for the blind community. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at, being able to dock and save your activities and so on. Tracking the activities. So this is what I mentioned a little bit in our field work. What we see is people get lost in what they've been doing, um, where if you have visual abilities, you just look and you kind of go, oh, that's what, you know, yeah, I remember where I was. Um, but you have to reread the whole thing if you are doing this in a non-visual way. So we're working on being able to replay the interaction history in a little bit faster way that's a combination of audio and tactile. Um, and then finally, the transparency. This is the piece where I was mentioning that the system's doing things to you and for you um, that you may or may not be able to see. So again, thinking about what are the contexts and just helping people sort of orient themselves within the system. Um, so this has led us to the system that we call KIND, which is multimodal. And I apologize, we printed it with black plastic, which was stupid because you can't see it. Um, <laughs> But this has, again, it incorporates the scroll bar, which can do a whole bunch of things. So it can switch, depending on what mode you're in, and that's what the crank on the side is doing, is it's switching the mode. The scroll bar can be used to switch between applications, to switch between documents, to move within an individual document, depending on the mode that you're in. And then the little chip, the little RFID-enabled chip that you see Mark pulling on the side, that's our activity context. So that's your little nugget that's going to save everything about that particular activity that you are working on uh, at any time. And this is meant to work alongside screen readers. We have to develop a custom screen reader for our use, but eventually you could imagine these kinds of things being something that you could cheaply plug in just like you would a new mouse, and it will just automatically work with the system. Uh, so that gives you a sense of where we're at from the tangible side of things. Um, this is a little bit, those of you who were at lunch, it's a little bit what we were just talking about. Uh, there's this idea of all of these new kinds of interfaces that are not our typical screens and not our typical mobile and wearable devices. And Milgram came up with this virtuality continuum now um, quite a long time ago, 20 some plus years ago, um, <laughs> which is disturbing, makes us all feel old. Um, <laughs> but this idea of you sort of have the most physical, we have our tangibles on the one side, and they just talk to you about the tangible desktop and kind. But again, for our accessibility populations and, and other underrepresented groups, all along the spectrum, I think it's important to explore what are the sort of constraints within these new kinds of platforms and what are they affording um, our, our non-typical users as well. So we'll switch over to AR a little bit, and I'll switch to autism and thinking about autism for a minute. OK, face-to-face -face communication. We all think of this as something that, for most people, is pretty straightforward. You learned it over the period of 10 to 20 years. It's not as straightforward as you think it is. Um, we spend a lot of time working with children to learn to do face-to-face -face communication. Um, but once you become an adult, for most people, it's fairly straightforward. And we think about this a lot. You'll hear people talk about kids with autism as being verbal or nonverbal. Um, and verbal is about what we say. So this is the words that are coming out of my mouth. But actually, face-to-face -face interactions include a ton of nonverbal stuff. And the nonverbal is what we actually mean. 
And this is a point of great frustration for people with autism. Why don't you just say what you mean? That's really irritating. Why are you still talking to me about the weather when you actually want to talk to me about something entirely different? So if you take a worldview and you have a kind of way of communicating that's very focused on the verbal, the nonverbal is really challenging. And this includes our eye contact. So I look around. I'm actually amazed. Most of you are not on your computers, which is shocking. This looks nothing like an Irvine presentation. Um, I make eye contact with you guys from time to time. Body language, right? I gesture probably too much. Whoever has to deal with the mic, I'm sorry. I tend to wave wildly. Um, proximity, right? It would be super weird if I started having the talk like this. Right? So we naturally, or, or have been instructed through our cultural lenses over years to deal with proximity. And then prosody, that's sort of how we say what we say. So all four of these can be challenging for people with autism to regulate in a way that the rest of us understand and interpret correctly. Um, but what we find is that autistic people can regulate, particularly proximity and prosody, those were the two issues that we looked at because they're really hard to treat in the clinical literature more easily with mixed reality support. So let me talk about those each in turn. I'll start with proximity. So i just show you, you guys an example. How many of you know a close talker? Come on, yeah, you know close talkers. It's horrible, they're like in your personal space, right? And at least in Western cultures, 46 to 120 centimeters is the appropriate space for we're having a relatively intimate conversation but you're not close talking me. You get within 46 centimeters and it's, registers for most people is uncomfortable. A relatively new acquaintance, you should be 121 to 370 centimeters away, don't get closer than that. And if you're farther than that, I'm gonna think you don't wanna talk to me, which is as important as the being too close, is that I'm not gonna engage you in a social conversation if you're sitting at a public space distance, right? So we've, we're each sitting at the park and we don't want to talk to one another, this is an appropriate space. And for a lot of people with autism, they have trouble regulating both the too close and too far. So they may want to engage socially and are not sort of walking up to the group and therefore feel excluded because the group doesn't recognize that they want to talk to them. So we have these inadvertent miscommunications. And this is just a mismatch, right? This is what I always try to say to people. This is not that autistic people are doing this wrong and the rest of us are doing it right, but it's a mismatch. So we're regulating our space in a slightly different way and that creates miscommunication. So we worked with um, a wearable and augmented reality system that we call Procom. Uh, this is an early prototype. Um, I don't have any pictures of the newer, the newer one without kids in them, so <laughs> you have to live with this one. Um, but the idea here is that we basically have scanning so that I understand where the other people are. We wanted to uh, have this be a wearable system so that kids could take it out into the world and we don't have to instrument their conversation partner or a room so it was as close to naturalistic as possible. And we sort of talked to them about where's the, where do we detect other people to be and where might you want to be if you want to engage with them socially or where might you want to be if you don't want to and, and so on. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the deep, deep, deep details of this except to say green means basically there's a pretty good match between what they think is going on and, and what our proximity metrics would give us. Yellow means we're a little bit in a borderline space and red means there's some sort of problem, either way too far away or way too close. Um, and what you see is in the baseline trials, no tools. Some of the kids with autism do just fine, which was surprising because they clinically came in with their parents and their teachers complaining that they had trouble with proximity regulation. In, in a controlled study, they actually adapted fine, which indicates it's probably not a proximity regulation problem so much as that they don't care, they're not paying attention problem. Um, but then we've got other kids who did struggle, and then most of them, with the exception of this little guy, um, corrected to some degree with use of the tool. Again, walk up and use kind of situation, not training. Um, for those who are interested, this one was just really excited about the tool and ran up to our, uh, the research confederate and stood right next to her and was like, look right here, you can see us on here, which of course registers as way too close, um, but was actually a socially appropriate thing to be doing. Okay, um, so let's switch over to prosody, which is a little bit harder of a concept to understand. Has anybody ever heard the word prosody before? Okay, there are some, well, you would have, but uh, there are some of this stuff. So basically, prosody is this. 
It's the difference between me saying hot dog and hot dog, right? You know what those two words uh, or two phrases mean. And then, of course, the forever hot diggity dog. Um, so a combination of the actual words that we use and the way that we say them is what prosody is, and that's what conveys our meaning. And the challenge for our kiddos, particularly in schools, and particularly for young adults trying to get their first couple of jobs, is prosody comes across, or, or uh, mismatches in prosody for kids with autism come across as they're being bored, they're tired, they're angry, they're sarcastic. Um, often none of those emotions uh, and feelings actually apply. But because of the way that we interpret the way that people are talking to us, we associate those characteristics with them. And I'll just let you look at this. Um, I won't play the audio for you, but the blue is uh, a teenager without autism, and the yellow is a teenager with autism. Um, and they're having a conversation. And you can see across the top, they're a little bit loud at first, but then basically the volume stays relatively stable. But the pitch range is dramatically different. This is a really small pitch range. This is within 25 hertz. I cannot achieve a pitch range that small unless I hum. That's how small it is. And we, you'll see within individual words, a typical speaker will change pitch, sometimes 200 hertz, within a, a single word. Um, and so this is what comes across as bored, because they're essentially relatively monotone to our ears. And so what we wanted to do was create an in situ intervention so that instead of role playing and practicing and scripting, we could actually give feedback on the fly. So you go into a social interaction or you go into a job interview and you get the feedback immediately on two issues. One is volume, so matching volume. It's not so much that uh, people with autism are too loud or too quiet, but that they mismatch with their conversation partner. So if I'm being loud, you should be loud too. If I'm being quiet, you should be quiet too. And that's the way we're most happy in a conversation. Um, this does inevitably mean that everyone talking to me winds up yelling by the end of the conversation because I have terrible volume regulation. Um, and then the, the pitch mode. So we experimented with a whole bunch of different kinds of notifications and in the end found that just flashing up flat whenever there was the monotone uh, voice detected was easy enough um, for people to respond to. And we did a couple of experiments with this. One was an in-lab super controlled experiment with four young adults with autism and the other was a field study with these are young adults in a um, program for teaching them software testing. Um, you've probably seen in the news, there's a bunch of these programs now. It turns out that a lot of adults with autism, not all, but a lot are really good at software testing. Um, so this is a program focused on, on teaching them to be professional software testers. And we tested with them with both the volume mode and the pitch mode. And I won't go through all the details of this except to say that basically what you see here is volume works pretty well, pitch basically not at all. Um, and why is this? Does anyone have any ideas why this might be? Yeah. I guess pitch is something uh, one's less aware of and it's hard to regulate. Yeah, pitch is really hard to regulate. Um, volume is, uh, you're not really aware of it either, but it's pretty easy to regulate, right? So I'm a person who gets louder and louder and louder as a conversation goes on, but if you just say to me like, shh, then I am able to regulate it. I can pull it down, right? I can talk at this level. But pitch is much harder and it cre it's really contextual. So we don't yet have the tools, at least not on things like Google Glass, to predict where the conversation is going. So what, one of the common problems that you'll see in a conversation between a typical person um, and, a, and a person with autism is you'll see um, that they each don't know when the other one's done talking um, because we tend to end our sentences in particular ways if we're done talking. Um, and those are different ways depending on whether or not you have autism. So that's an example there. It also turns out that upon more research, we're starting to think that this is a biomarker. Um, so there's some, which basically means something you cannot change. Um, and so there's some research going on at the University of Notre Dame around trying to detect these same kinds of pitch irregularities in babies to see if the crying actually looks different enough that you could use that as a screener for autism. So it may be that it's not changeable. Yeah. That would be fascinating. I, I also wonder, you know, the one on the left essentially gives you a ratio variable. That is, I can sort of, I can 
I can get feedback as to right. how loud or how quiet I am, whereas just being told I'm flat, I might undercompensate, I might overcompensate, I don't know how yeah. far I need to go. Yeah, and I do think that's part of the problem, and you even see that in, in therapeutic settings, where what a common kind of therapy is that you'll record, you'll video record a conversation and then play that back and see like, okay, listen here. Um, and what's fascinating is that most of the young adults anyway with autism that we, we brought in, we do that kind of work with them, they don't hear it, even in the video back. Whereas the volume, they'll say, oh yeah, I can see, like I'm being quite loud. Um, and so us giving the feedback, if you, can't, if you don't even know what we're telling you is happening, it's really hard to then compensate for that. Um, and as I say, I can't make myself trigger it, right? So I can't go the other direction either, yeah. Um, I had a couple of questions about that second graph. So, like, in the no treatment, it goes down anyway, uh, like, from session one, two, to three, and the sun is interpreting that. Why is that? Uh, so, probably random chance, um, but it's not really three sessions. It's nine sessions, and they're randomly distributed. So you might get one treatment, and then no treatment, and then a different treatment, and then that same again, if that makes sense. So they're overlaid as though they're three, but it's actually nine, so it could well be that that's just like the last session for a lot of people. Um, but we don't really know. Uh, mostly, we don't know is the answer to what's going on with pitch. It's just a little bit all over the place. Um, but none of these are very good. This is 20, at the bottom here, you've got 2015. It doesn't go all the way down to zero. Sort of irregular pitch events in a very short conversation. So if you and I were to have this, you would have zero. Um, so those numbers, it's not a great graph. <laughs> so then how do you conclude that the volume went well? Ah, that is a great question. We don't say it's going well, we say it's getting better. So we don't really know. And maybe it, if we did longer treatment, it would get even better. Or maybe this would be, um, as good as it's going to get, but that it's trending in the right direction. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. It just struck me that there is uh, the, the kind of differences that you see over here between autistic people and non-autistic people. Um, the same kind of differences could also show up between two people from, say, two different countries yeah. or cultures. Um, is there literature in that space that's relevant to this? And or like, what's the difference there in terms of how you might think about that difference versus this kind of difference? Um, I, there's not a ton of literature in that space, although increasingly more because distance collaboration work, now that we have such worldwide distributed teams, there's a lot of people in the workplace studies who are looking at that. Um, are we getting mismatches in our communication because I'm having a talk with a dev in China and a designer in Brazil and I'm here and you know those kinds of issues. Um, so there's more of that coming. I would say the difference is whether or not you can learn it. Right, um, and so that's what we were, that's why we're interested in pitch is that it seems not learnable. Um, volume tends to be very learnable by typical, um, typically developing people really quickly. You know, if you if you go if you get thrown into a room in which people are really loud, even if you're a basically quiet person, you compensate fairly quickly. Most most people do, um, whereas people with autism won't necessarily unless you tell them to. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, moving along our virtuality continuum, uh, the AR stuff that we were interested in was really about sort of real world experiences. So we wanted to get out of the clinical setting and say what happens when we're playing on the playground, what happens when we're going for a job interview and so on. Um, that all requires co-location. In a whole other stream of my research I'm not gonna talk about today, we've been looking at virtual worlds for kids with autism and this being a safe, fun place to play because your best friend might be somebody else with autism who's two, two states over. Um, or social skills groups, which tend to be therapeutically uh, driven, but they want people with sort of similar um, 
symptom configurations who are working on similar kinds of goals to come together. Well, in Southern California, we have really bad traffic. I don't know if you guys know anything about that up here. Um, and this is really hard to get five kids with a similar sort of look to, to what's going on and similar goals to a place at four o'clock in the afternoon to work with a therapist is wicked on their parents and on the schools. So we started to think about, well, could we use virtual reality as a way to get a similar kind of high quality, in-depth social experience for for these kids, but um, at a distance. And we really didn't know. Like, this is a big risk. Um, I'll give my student, Luann Boyd, a lot of credit for taking this on, because we didn't know if we would even be, you know, we don't really know if anybody detects things like sound or distance or whatever in the same way. Our perception's quite different in VR than in the physical world, and so we didn't know if any of this would work. Um, but we replicated the ProCom work to some degree. So what you see there is sort of a visualization showing your personal space bubble. And then if you get to uh, E there, oh, your two space bubbles are getting close together. Um, so we pop you up a warning and say, you know, you might want to think about how close you really want to be to this person or this person. And you have to get crazy close, by the way, to pop up this E step away um, notification. But there's been lots of, for those who follow the news about what's going on in VR, there's been a lot of sort of borderline assault cases in VR that people then claim, oh, I didn't know that it was like so uncomfortable to be right on top of this person in this space. So we don't know, is this a perceptual thing or what? But we wanted to look at this as sort of a broad piece. And then down here, you have, again, the volume visualizations trying to help people understand their volume in relation to their conversation partner. And then the yellow, yellow pink bar there is turn taking, sort of similar to Kari Kahalias' work, visualizing what the balance of a conversation is. Um, and this is uh, one of our kiddos using the VR headset. Did this with about a dozen um, kids with autism. Here's the fun thing. Totally the opposite results that we saw in the augmented reality situation. So um, what you see here is proximity regulation worked pretty well. The kids struggled more with proximity re regulation, as you saw in the augmented reality setting. But volume worked not at all. Um, and why is this important? Well, it turns out, if you think about how VR systems are designed, we're very careful about the visual stimulus. And we also presented, we did a lot of work on that visual stimulus. Volume is very much mediated by the microphones and the headphones that you're using. So what would happen is the kids would just turn their volume down or move the mic away or do other kinds of things. And so in terms of them actually regulating their voice, they were using the systems to regulate their voice then, rather than them doing it themselves, um, which may be just fine. If we think about a sort of prosthetic model, um, then maybe that's OK. And in fact, I was talking with a friend at Microsoft Research who uh, works on voices in games um, for the Xbox games, and he was suggesting that even with the pitch, what if we could just reproduce the voice amplified so you take the pitch variation that is existent and expand it and reproduce their same voice with an expanded pitch. I have no idea if that would work or not, but there's an interesting idea of what if we move to a prosthetic model as opposed to a rehabilitative model, which is what we're using here. Um, but we don't really, you know, we're trying to figure out what does all this mean? You know, it, the kids definitely understood the feedback. They reported understanding it. They weren't confused by it. But proximity definitely worked much better. Um, so we're trying to kind of figure out what that means over time. OK, so remember this, back to this, new platforms, all this. Um, so we started out today by talking about a variety of types of personalization that industry in particular is interested in. Um, and we've moved from sort of point and click through the 3D printed and tangible into augmented and virtual reality and so on. Um, but I want to pull back a bit to the speech and chat based interfaces um, that might feed off of our moods or our gestures or other kinds of things that we might be able to use in these other spaces. Um, and this is the piece um, that's the startup that I'm working on at the moment. OK, so it's insurance. I know insurance is something most of you probably don't think about. If you think about insurance, it usually means something bad happened. Uh, you or someone in your family had a house up in Napa. That would be a time you'd be thinking about insurance. You had a car accident. Um, your roommate left the faucet on all night. These are times that insurance comes up. But the truth is that actually if you look at what's going on, particularly for vulnerable populations uh, and for developing world, 
um, issues. Insurance is an economic driver that pushes a lot of the kind of positive development um, that we would like to see. So a very simple one of these is why do we not have self-driving cars? How many of you have a car that has the capability to drive by itself right now? Okay, how many of you even have cars? You're not, and I'm not in a car world. Um, okay, if I asked that same question in Southern California, half the room would raise their hands, right? The technology is here. The reason we don't have self-driving cars is because we don't know who the heck should insure them. We don't know if it should be the manufacturer, if it should be the occupant, uh, if it should be the owner, because the owner and the occupant might be two different people, um, and so on. Same thing, when you go to developing countries and other kinds of underrepresented areas, Development happens when people can reduce their risk. So when I can buy a house and insure it, there's not nearly as much risk when I can buy a car and insure it and so on. Um, but at the same time, it's a super old industry. It's a massive mess. Um, and what we know is that current sales and service models are super expensive. And risk pools, the sort of original model of insurance is basically Five of us in the room get together, we each throw 20 bucks in a bucket, if one of us trips on a stone a couple days later and you get the 100 bucks out of the, out of the bucket, right? That's what a risk pool does. Um, but it's, they're large, they're diffuse, they're not comprehensible, and they're really coarse grained and hard to administer. So if you don't believe me, two years ago, 60% of insurance commission revenue was compensation for the producing agent. That's ridiculous. More than half of the money is going to insurance salespeople. It's not going to pay for your revenues. That's not risk pooling anymore. That's a financial instrument. And the coarse grained issue. So here's Palo Alto. <laughs> here's the old flood boundaries. Your flood maps were recently redrawn. Homeowners in the room, you're probably aware of this because your flood insurance changed based on these boundaries. Blue regions mean there's about a 1% chance per year. This is what people call a 100-year floodplain. It's a really terrible way to describe things because 1% chance means like 35% chance over the life of your mortgage. That's a more uh, comprehensible way to think about that. Um, orange is a 500-year flood, so that's 2.2% chance uh, in any given year. But this is basically how FEMA does this. If your house is here, you buy insurance and you buy it at a certain rate. If your house is here, you buy insurance and you buy it at a more expensive rate. And if your house is here, you don't have to buy insurance. This is stupid. This is not how floods work, right? <laughs> um, this is how floods work, right? So what we saw in this hurricane season, and if you don't have family on the East Coast, you may or may not have been paying that much attention to this year's hurricane season. Um, but what we see is that because it's all built on these risk pools and these very coarse grained models, you have development in places that there probably shouldn't be. You have people who have the least ability to understand the statistics and the flood models living in the places where they shouldn't be developing. And we hit the poorest and most vulnerable among us, and they're typically underinsured, and they're paying too much for it. So it's a combination of issues. So then how do we fix that? Well, the problem is insurance is confusing. And personalized quality service traditionally has required human agents. So that gets us back to the 60% of, of what you're paying for your insurance is going to that person who's helping you buy it. So if we replace this with better data science to help us target these niche products, we understand those data models so that we can make it understandable. We create new platforms that allow us to do things like show you a visualization of what a flood's going to actually look like at your house instead of just a map that says you're in or you're out of a flood boundary. Help people pay online, have chatbots to do automated sales and service so we can drive down costs and you get a virtuous cycle because if you drive down costs, you get more people to enter the pool, you get more people to enter the pool, you drive down costs and round and round and round it goes. Um, so this is what we're trying to do right now to make, we're, we're staying out of health, health is a mess, but we're trying to make property and casualty better for the people who are most vulnerable and most in need of, of this kind of service. All right, so across three very different um, sets of issues, so we've got uh, blind user interfaces, uh, kids and adults with autism, and then uh, insurance for underrepresented groups. What we see is machine intelligence and new platforms provide us new ways of creating these user experiences that hopefully are lower in cost and higher in quality. This is always the big question. 
And then my big goal, the thing I care the most about is that we have broader engagement. Broader engagement in our design processes, broader engagement in using our computational systems, in having social lives and having social experiences, and then entering and remaining in the economic market, whether it's because you're now able to get a job or whether it's because you're now able to buy a house or uh, purchase insurance or whatever. So. Thank you to all of you for listening to all of this, to all of these people for paying for all of this. Come to UCI. It's really warm and sunny and near the beach. Um, and our applications for our master's in HCI program will be available very soon. PhD applications are already available. And we're hiring two HCI faculty this year. And we particularly want technical faculty. So all you awesome computer scientists who do HCI work, please come. And there's all my info. And I finished right on time. Yay! Time for a couple questions. And those who need to go to class, escape. I won't judge you. Oh, she's judging right now. <laughs> <laughs> they might judge you. I can't say anything about your, your faculty here. Yeah. I'm wondering why are like shape displays not used like more widely among like the visually impaired, like fresh line people. Um, well, I don't know about shape, the shape display in particular. <laughs> That's its own thing. But lots of tangibles are used by the blind community. So for example, you'll see tangible um, uh, school um, artifacts. So for example, you're trying to teach kids about sine, cosine, and, and so on. You actually have pieces of wood or um, 3D printed increasingly um, pieces that will show that. One of the big challenges with those things is, again, they're sort of static. They have to get printed, all of those kinds of things. So there are people who are working on, can we dynamically create tangible displays in classrooms and other places? Um, so you do see that. Largely, it's an issue of expense and accessibility. Um, we're all, everybody's super excited about 3D printers. We talked to like Jen Mankoff and Amy Hurst and a bunch of other people who are doing really cool stuff, except for the big problem is what? Anybody know? 3D printers themselves are not accessible. So you can't print the thing that you want to print to help you do the thing that you need to do. So you always have to have someone helping you. So this is, this, these are sort of big problems. So what you'll see instead is like teachers and families investing in these kinds of technologies for their kids. But once you get out um, and you're independent and you sort of got your stuff going, you, you get pretty good with your screen reader or whatever. Um, and you sort of just tolerate the badness, um, which is not a good way to go about life. But there you have it. So we need to do better. We, we really need to do better. And the gap is growing, right? So every time you see a really cool web interface that's super dynamic and responsive, you've widened the gap. Um, and that's a real problem, right? So when it was like DOS, you could actually, like DOS and a screen reader, that's fairly comparable experience, actually. Um, but we're widening the gap, and, and we need to do better. And the basic legal requirements for accessibility is just not good enough. Um, I'm not too familiar with this, but I was wondering if for pitch, because pitch sounds like a really hard concept to show and think about and try to fix, if there's some sort of visualization perhaps that can help you, in, like if you could visualize it in real time in a way that you could try to fix it in real time? Yeah, try. we tried. Um, I would really welcome anyone else who wants to try better visualization people uh, than I am. I need to get like Jeff here on this or something. Um, you know, um, we tried a bunch of different things. And basically, it was all cognitively too complex in the moment, which is how we settled on just flashing flat. Because when you're trying to, most people can't interpret graphs. There's, I forget what the percentage is, but there's some ridiculous percentage of graph illiteracy um, in America. And so you've got to now teach people to interpret the graph or whatever the other visualization is. And we tried a bunch um, and have a conversation. And it's already hard enough to have a conversation. If you think about you know, when you're getting alerts, you're having a conversation while driving, and you're trying to pay attention to that or whatever. Same kind of thing, right? So we don't want to distract people too much. Um, Visualizations and other kinds of things like that is something that people do in a reflective model, so not a in the moment model. Um, and that's something behavioral therapists are quite good at. And I will tell you, even there, if you look across the literature, we're not making good progress on pitch, even in a reflective model. So we kind of knew it was unlikely um, that we'd make good progress, but we wanted to see. Um, the other thing I will tell you is our dosages are small. 
So if you think in sort of a medical model of uh, pharmacological dosages, most of our studies, because we're working with people who it's really hard for them to get into the lab, um, whether it's because you're blind or you have autism or you know, you're low income or whatever, it's really hard to get into the lab. It's really hard for us to get to you. We typically don't have them using these systems over really extended periods of time. One of the things I think my lab especially needs to do better at, but I think all of us need to do better at, is upping, upping that exposure and seeing if maybe we are actually making a difference, but we just can't measure it because we don't have high dosages. Yeah. You mentioned that um, neurotypical folks and folks who are not neurotypical have a difficult time like figuring out when sentences have ended for each other. Uh, is there some c consistency in terms of like pitch or other factors between folks of different cultures such that like someone could learn when a sentence is ending? Or? Yeah, I don't know the cultural stuff. I can tell you gender, though. Um, women almost always up talk. Um, I just did it. Right? Um, and so uh, this is really interesting, right? Because th there's lots of studies of whether if you can teach yourself as a woman to not up talk, if you actually come across as stronger and more confident and all these other kinds of things. Um, I also have a, a student who is trans and so grew up um, being socialized to talk like a woman and he up talks when he talks. And so in person, you don't notice it. We overcompensate with the visual channel. But on the phone, people always think he's a woman, um, despite the fact that he's on testosterone. He's transitioned a long time ago. Um, but it's the up talk that basically signals woman. Um, so there's one for you. And I can't, I've actually tried to train myself not to up talk because of that. And I'm terrible. I mean, you can hear me doing it all the time. Now I'm all self-conscious about it. But um, so that's something to look at. I'm sure there are things culturally about when we end a sentence, how long do you wait before you talk again, um, all of those kinds of things. I have a, one of my best friends, her husband's an attorney, and I will say this is a hilarious one. He can't ever get a word in when he's around professors, but when we're around all the attorneys, it's a very different thing, and it's because attorneys are strongly socialized to wait an appropriate amount of time before speaking after someone else speaks because if you cut someone off in court, it's really a problem. You, you can like go to jail for it. Um, and whereas faculty, we just all over each other, right? Um, so there's, there are certainly, if you, if you think of those as like microcultures, there are certainly cultural indicators of when someone's done talking. Yeah. Question offline, actually, oh. since it's past time. Excellent. Thank all you. Right. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.